come back. Sister Couples is here, but let's continue to pray for her. The Haley's, let's continue to pray for them. Brother Bray's sister, let's continue to pray for her. She's on hospice and needs a touch from the Lord. Preston Miles, we got more good news from him this week. He was able to come home for the weekend, but I think he's going back to rehab today or is it tomorrow? Okay. Okay. This little six-year-old boy's had the four-wheeler wreck, and uh, Preston is, uh, well, he's got near to all of our hearts. Uh, Brother Butch Parnell is able to be here today, but let's continue to pray for him. I want God to strengthen him and just heal him from his sickness. Brother Tracy Newman, also Sister Misty Chester's mother, passed away uh, yesterday evening late. Let's hold that family up in prayer. And I know there's many other needs on the screen behind me. Many of you have requests. You do slip your hand up. God knows what it is. He cares about your need. He cares about your need. That's the beautiful things. He told us to cast all of our cares upon him for he cares for us. Amen. Let's pray for this service today. Did you come expecting something from God? I tell you, he's got whatever you need. Whatever you're searching for, whatever you're looking for, he's got it. So if you will join me in standing today, let's just take these knees to him and prepare our hearts to receive whatever he has for us in this place. Lord, we're so thankful for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we exalt your name today for your great and your greatly to be praised. Lord, we look to you for help. We look to you for strength. We look to you for power. Lord, we look to you to change us. God, I ask that you reach down in each one of these needs and manifest your spirit and your power to each person that has a request of any kind. Lord, I ask that you allow the healing virtue to flow over those that are sick. Lord, I ask for strength for them that may be weak today. God, I ask for protection upon them that may be traveling. But Lord, most importantly, I ask that you just visit this service today. Let your anointing rest upon us today. Let your power fill this room. Let, let, let us leave here being changed by the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, let every song that be sang and every word that be spoken be anointed today. And let it be exactly what you would have us to have. Lord, for this we give you praise, glory, and honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? The psalmist said it like this. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I'm thankful today that I can come to church. I'm thankful today that I know who Jesus is. I'm thankful today that I have the freedom to worship. And I'm going to go ahead and just praise him and lift him up for he alone is worthy. Let's get behind the worship team and let's worship and praise our God today. How many believe the God of the breakthrough is in the building?
Lord. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost here today. There's nothing like it. You can't buy this at Walmart. It doesn't come in a bottle and it doesn't come in a pill. But I'm going to tell you, it comes when you walk in the presence of Almighty God. I'm glad to be in His presence today. So honored to have you here. Our ushers are going to come forward. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings today. And we're going to give unto the Lord. If you want to text to give, the number's on the screen. You can text to give. If you want to get online, you can give online. But I would like for every one of you just march and come around because there's something about approaching the altar. God meet you there. Amen. We will march. If you'll march out of the right end of your pew and back around to the left end of your pew, it flows real smooth and nobody has to step on anyone. If you have a guest card that you have filled out, you would like to lay it in the offering plate today, we would honor, we would be honored to have that as well. If you will, let's worship with these men in music and let's give them to the Lord today as he has prospered us. here today we welcome you thank you for coming to worship with us the GT ladies fellowship is October the 24th and they're going to be meeting from 7 to 8 at corner 415 for a time of fellowship and dessert so if your ladies are smart you'll go down there and get you one of those good old skillet cookies well bless the Lord oh my soul they're good had a couple of them this week and they're good <laughs> Every time. But nevertheless, also that would be for the ladies only. Guys, if you're going to get a skillet cookie that night, get it to go. Anyway, uh, the, also the toddlers are going to go to the pumpkin patch. And you know what? I'm glad the toddlers are going. There's nothing like watching those kids have fun at the pumpkin patch. And there's a lot of things that will be going on that day. That was going to be on October the 26th at 10 a.m. They'll leave here, here at the church and all that's important things. And if you... Uh, haven't got your bulletin, you can get one after church. They'll be in the foyer there. We are honored today to have some very special guests with us. And I, I say that with all due regards. They could be at home. And there's no pastor in the world that'd rather be anywhere but that at home. And I believe that. However, he took out of his time and out of his schedule, and he has come here. Brother Dwayne Cornelius and his wife, Sister Heather Cornelius, come from Smithville, Tennessee. They've never been here before, but we're honored that they would come. Aren't we glad to have them today? They pastor a revival church. They pastor a church that's on the move. And I like that. I like that. And I know that they, I, I give honor to their congregation for allowing them to be here because you know what? It, they're probably missing their pastor today. Uh, I hope so anyway. We're glad that they're here in Corinth, Mississippi, and I believe he's got a word for us. I really do. I uh, scheduled him, I don't know, several months ago now, and we worked on dates and finally come to this date, and I didn't know we were going to have a guest last week, but you know what? God knew all that all along, and that's okay. I believe he's come with a word for you. I believe he's come a word for me, and you know what I need to do? I need to prepare myself to receive it. 
Whatever God has is what I want. I never, I, we talk about when you're doing a business deal, leaving so much money on the table. It ain't no fun. I had a guy tell me just this week he done a business deal and he said, when he walked off, he said, I know I left $35,000 laying on the table. That hurts. It hurts because you think, man, I could have been $35,000 to better. However, when we walk out of church, many times we leave more on the table than $35,000. God's got greater things in us than money can buy. And so many times we walk out of his presence without taking what he has for us. I want to receive it all today. Amen? Would you stand to your feet one more time? Let's simply bow our heads and ask God's presence to be in the remaining of this service. Lord, we need you today. We come to you wanting to hear from heaven. I'm asking for a special anointing upon us today to hear your word, but not just hear it, but apply it to our lives. Make us doers of your word as well. Anoint Brother Cornelius as he brings us that word and help us, Lord, to do whatever you bid us to do. For this we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we welcome Brother Cornelius as he comes today? Brother Cornelius, fill it home. Amen. God bless you today. Uh, you can be seated for just a moment if you would like. It is such a distinct honor to be here today and uh, be with your pastor and, and uh, bishop, and we are so honored that we would be asked to be here. Um, and a lot of great men that have been across this pulpit. You had one last weekend, and uh, you get one every week when your pastor's here or your bishop was here this morning, and so I counted an honor to be here today and um, again, we do miss being at home. Um, I don't, I don't like being away and, uh, I need to make sure that that's on tape so that my church hears it. Uh, they begin to think maybe I like going away from home and I don't, um, but they'll have church today, uh, because that's just what we do around there. And so we want them to have church and, uh, I want to hear good reports. I don't know how it works around here, but hold them, but sometimes they have better church when I'm gone. <clears throat> and so, um. If that's the case, I think I ought to get more fishing in or something uh, if that's what's going to happen. But we are, we are distinctly honored to be here today. I'll take a little bit more time this evening and try to just, uh, I just want you to know that we are honored to be here. And thank you, Pastor, First Lady, Bishop, Sister Hodum. Uh, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, and um, let me just put a plug in for him. It shouldn't just be one month out of the year we show appreciation for a spiritual leader in our lives. That should be something we're thankful for all of the time. Amen. You're thankful for great leadership? Thankful for great leadership. It's an honor to have my wife with me as well. Uh, my children are at home, and uh, they are helping lead worship and, and those things that they do at home. I have all adult children, one married, another one getting married, and I know you didn't think for a moment that I looked old enough. We didn't start that early. We're just old, so... But we are honored to have them all apart. I'm going to read one verse of scripture here today. I don't know what your custom is here, but if you would just stand maybe for one scripture. And then if you will allow me, we're going to pray one more time. I feel that I have a word for you here this morning. A very distinct word today. I, I feel for tonight as well. There's something uh, special that God has in store for us. I don't think these things happen just by happenstance. I, I think God orchestrates. And I don't believe that anybody ever shows up just because... You might have been invited. Somebody might have invited you to come. Somebody might have pressured you so much you finally said, let me just go so they'll quit bothering me. But I distinctly believe that everything is ordained by God. And so you're here for a reason. So let me just read one verse of scripture, Matthew chapter 15, verse number 28. Simply says this, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Very familiar portion of scripture, but I believe there's something we can point out in this as we go through this morning. I want to talk to you about the fact that each and every one of us are crumb worthy. 
We are crumb worthy. And so let's pray one more time, if you will. I'll ask God to touch us. Lord, we love you today. God, we thank you again for this opportunity, Lord, to be in your house. God, we never want to take it for granted. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will touch today in the precious name of Jesus. God, this church, these people, God, I pray, Lord, that you'll anoint my lips, God, and my heart to deliver your anointed word. God, anoint our ears, God, to hear it. God, our hearts to respond to it. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There's something about the name of Jesus. You started singing about that just a minute ago, and there is a power that rests in here when you begin to talk about the name of Jesus. And so I just want to talk to you a few minutes this morning. I have a very distinct target, a very specific target this morning. I want to speak to individuals who feel that you have continued to seek, but you have not yet found the answer you're looking for. You feel unworthy of the blessings and the favor of God. And you are absolutely overwhelmed with a feeling of loss and filled with questions. Very distinct target this morning. And I think that probably touches on several of us in this room here today. And so if you'll just allow me a few minutes and just respond to the word of God, I pray that God will touch us. I am going to do just a little bit of expository. So if you want to follow along in your Bible in Matthew chapter 15, we're going to talk about this story just a little bit. But verse 21 of that chapter says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre, Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan. That's key that that was mentioned. A woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Purposefully, we need to tie in, and there is a reason why this tie in to history is here when the writer refers to this woman of Canaan. It brings to memory the promised land, if you will, prior to the children of Israel conquering it. The people of Canaan were the outcast ones, they were the ones who were not worthy. And so it's very distinct that the writer makes a point to say, This is a woman of Canaan. This is someone who is an outcast, if you will. This is someone who is not worthy. I want you to understand understand this morning that the devil will do the very same thing anytime you try to make a move towards God. If you have never known him and you're making choices to draw closer to him and change your life, be sure that the devil will bring your past to mind. He will see to it that you feel unworthy of the love and of the mercy and of the grace of God. That's his job. He's going to make you feel unworthy. If you are a child of God who has slipped, I promise you the devil will remind you of those mistakes. I want you to understand if you are trying to draw closer to God, in relationship and in covenant. I believe it is a covenant relationship we have, but if you're trying to draw closer in relationship and covenant, the devil will do his best to show you how this is the best that it's ever going to get and you don't deserve anything else from God. That's just how the devil operates. He's going to show you you don't deserve anything else from God. But hear me this morning. I'm not going to take a long time to get going. I'm kind of one of those straight up helicopters. We just take off and go. I don't have a long runway here today. But hear me this morning when I tell you your past absolutely does not dictate your future. The mistakes that you have made in the past do not dictate where you're going in the future. The mess ups that you've had, the background that you had does not dictate your future with God. We heard about it in class this morning. There's a transformation that will take place. And who I am in the future is not anything about what I was in the past. I wish there were a few apostolics in the room that said, I remember what I used to be before God came in and changed me. I'm no longer what I used to be, but I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Mm. Hear me this morning when I tell you that where God will take you will not be hindered by where hell has had you. I don't know if you heard what I said, but where God will take you will not be hindered by where hell has had you. The sacrifice at Calvary gave you and I an opportunity to have every one of those sins remitted. I want you to hear me today when I tell you, you do not have to be weighted down by what God will lift off. 
You don't have to bear burdens that God said, I'm going to take them off of you. There's things that God said, I'm going to lift off. And you don't have to be weighted down by what God said. He will lift off. You don't have to have it. Don't let the enemy bring up your failures. Don't let him bring up the past. Because there is a God that will change what has been into what will be. None of us are worthy. None of us are worthy of the blessings of God. But I'm here to tell you, God died on a cross. And I don't ever want to make that a small episode because of what God has done for me. It is gigantic in my life, the fact that I have an opportunity to have my sins remitted. So this woman comes, this woman of Canaan, in verse 23, says that he answered her not a word. And say anything to her. The disciples even began to uh, come to him. They said they came and besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. Verse 24 says, but he answered and said, watch this. I'm not sent but unto the the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Something very unique happens in this exchange that took place. Something unique takes place here. Jesus doesn't even give the woman of Canaan the time of day. He's not even talking to her. He didn't say a word to her. He responds to his disciples who were complaining about a woman who just keeps pestering them. He's responding to them. He he speaks to them. But when he speaks to them, she's in earshot of what's being said. She can hear what's being said. He's, He's giving a foreshadow, if you will, of why he was here and who he was really here to reach for. And the timing for the Gentiles was not yet. But she's with an earshot. And so, again, not only will the enemy remind you of the past, he will also lie to you and lead you to believe that the blessings of God are not for you. He's not only going to remind you of what you've done wrong, he's also going to let you know there is nothing that God has that you deserve or that you could ever receive. You're not worthy of it. He's going to remind you there are only for people who have the right pedigree or have the right background or the right social status or they got the right bank account. That's the only ones that God died for. That's the only ones that his blessings are for. I've said this for years and I believe it with everything in me. You do not have to get good to get God. You've got to get God to get good. I wish you'd understand what I'm trying to tell you today. You don't have to change before you meet him. It's when you meet him that the change is going to happen. You don't have to do something specific. You don't have to have the right background or the right pedigree. You don't have to have the right social status. When you come in contact with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he will absolutely change everything you are. You don't have to get good to get God. you got to get God to get good. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. I'm thankful that I serve a Savior who loves me for who I am because he gave his life to see what I was going to become. He saw me for who I was, but he died for what I'm going to become. Don't allow the enemy to use your past mistakes and failures to hinder you from God's future blessing. Don't allow it to be a roadblock. Verse 25, so we get this story that's going along. This woman comes, she's pestering them. The disciples say, tell her to go away. Jesus responds to them, I didn't come for them. I've come for the house of Israel. And then this woman again, she comes up and she says to them in verse 25, she came and she worshiped, saying, Lord, help me. She was very persistent. When was the last time That you were so desperate for God that you didn't care what everybody else thought about you. She had just been put down. She had just been ignored. God didn't even respond to her plea and her cry. God didn't even listen to her, didn't even answer her. And all he simply did was speak back to the other people. And she began to worship him regardless of how she felt, regardless of the guilt, regardless of how unworthy she might have been. She began to worship him. When was the last time that you were so desperate you needed to get a hold of God regardless of what everybody else thought? Well, I can't go down to the altar if I do so. They're going to think something's wrong in my life. I really don't care. I've got to get a hold of God. I don't care what anybody else thinks. When was the last time you said, I need God right now more than I need my next breath, and I am not stopping till I get his attention? When was the last time? Some of us 
especially those that are a little older. I can put myself in that category now. Remember the Marx brothers. Remember Chico and Groucho and Harpo Marx. It was a time when Harpo was visiting New York and he was bombarded by requests of various charities to appear at their benefits that they were having. And after one particularly persistent woman had called him a dozen times in two days, Harpo reluctantly agreed to appear at that event for her charity. She offered personally to escort him to the event. And as they were leaving Harpo's hotel room, the telephone began to ring. And she said to him, she said, don't you want to go back and answer that phone? And he said, why bother? He responded wearily. He said, it's undoubtedly you calling again. (laughs) The Canaanite woman begged Jesus to cure her daughter, who she believed was troubled by a demon. And Jesus seems to ignore her plea, but she doesn't give up nor does she quit she keeps asking Jesus for help she keeps worshiping him she keeps asking him I wish that some of us could get like the woman who pestered Jesus some of us would be like the woman who pestered Harpo Marx I I overheard a saying one time pray like a pest give Jesus no rest Keep going until you get the answer that you've been looking for. I don't want to quit and give up because the enemy tells me that I don't deserve it or it doesn't belong to me. I understand I don't deserve it. I understand it doesn't belong to me. But that's not what I'm going to stop and and say no longer am I going to worship. I'm going to continue to worship because I understand what he did on Calvary and I'm just going to push enough. Some of us get caught up in that spot where I don't know if I want to keep asking. We need to get like uh, blind Barnabas in Mark chapter 10. It said when he heard that Jesus was coming, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And hear what happens. See, just like it does any other time you try to make a move for God, many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried out a more a great deal. Thou son of David. Have mercy on me. Notice when he continued on, when he persisted on, even when everything else told him he should stop, he persisted on and Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he's calling after you. If you continue enough, if you push enough, he said, I'm going to push beyond what everybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about me. It doesn't matter if everybody thinks that something's going wrong. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what everybody else thinks. I am desperate enough that I need God more right now than I have ever needed him in my life. And when you get that desperate, Jesus stops. All the other noise, all the other crowd, everything else was going on. Jesus stopped at that moment and said, somebody go get that man. And then notice something happens. Verse 50, it says, and he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what will I do for you? And the blind man said, Lord, I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith has made ye whole. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus in the way. I wish there was somebody that would get desperate enough for an encounter with God that says it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. I'm going to get a hold of him. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get a hold of him. I'm going to do whatever I can because I need a touch from Jesus. Maybe you don't understand how important that is that he took off that robe. Maybe you do. But they were identified by what they wore. In those days, they were identified. You knew that was a beggar, not just because he was sitting with a pan in front of him begging money. He was a beggar because of what he wore. It identified him. It's key in the fact that when he finally got God's attention, when he finally got the attention of Jesus, he took the robe off. He took the robe off, and here's what he said. I'm no longer going to be identified by that anymore because once I get a hold of Jesus, I'm no longer going to be a blind man anymore. He said, you need to understand something. I know that when I get a hold of Jesus, when I get his attention, I'm no longer going to struggle with whatever I struggled with before. I'm no longer going to be identified by what I was identified before. He knew before the blessing and miracle ever happened. He already knew I'm no longer going to be a blind man anymore because I got Jesus. 
So Jesus finally addresses her. Verse 26, and he answers and he says to her, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, Pastor, at that moment, some of us are out. He, he has offended me. He called me a dog. Some of you would pop up. Your head would cock a little bit. You don't know nothing about me. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> you don't know me. We would have got offended. I've done all of this work. I have embarrassed myself. By coming here, everybody has told me to get away. And I have embarrassed myself by calling on him. And he responds to me that I am a dog. Uh. But see, when you get desperate, it really doesn't matter. Because then she said, truth. You're right. I am. I am a dog. I don't deserve it. I shouldn't be here right now. There is nothing that qualifies me to be here right now. There is nothing that gives me the authority to be here right now. You are right. You have spoken the truth. But here's what I want you to understand. The dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Understand something. You have to understand something about this time period. Bread was something that was valuable. The father would bring bread home for his family, and, and it would be something that was such, uh, such sustaining value that it was not something that you would just haphazardly hand off to a dog. You, you just wouldn't do it. He was stating something that was a known fact in that time period. And so the only way that a dog of any kind would get any kind of bread was the crumbs that fell when the children would drop some. I have a 100-pound boxer at home. He knows better than to get around the table. He don't come to the table and beg. He's big enough, he just lays his head on the table. But he knows he don't come to the table and beg. You're not allowed to do that. But something unique happens. He understands something about children. And I don't even have small children. But when small children are at my house, he identifies with the crumb droppers. And he will, as best he can, he's too big, but as best he can, he will sneak his way in and get right up underneath those seats because he knows there's some goodness going to fall from that table underneath these little people right here. Daddy won't let me have nothing, but these little people right here are going to drop some stuff. Matter of fact, I'll find them reaching down and handing it to him. But he has understands something that the crumbs that fall, I can get a hold of. And here's what I need you to understand. There's something you need to understand about bread. The ingredients don't diminish by the size of the piece. Mm. <laughs> See, the same thing that is in the loaf is in the crumb. She said, you're right. I don't deserve the bread that's at the table. But she understood the same thing that's in the bread is in the crumb. And if all I can get a hold of right now is a crumb. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. If all I can get a hold of right now is a crumb, I want you to understand it's the same anointing. It's the same ingredients. It's the same thing in the crumb as it is in the whole loaf. She said, you're right. I don't deserve it. But just let me have some crumbs. Just let me have some crumbs. I'm crumb worthy. Just, just let me have some crumbs. I, I don't know. The right ingredients are important. I'm not a baker. I, I, don't, I don't bake. And uh, we had some good stuff last night over there with them skillet cookies and ice cream. And probably the best part of the whole thing was that frozen glass of milk. That just, that just makes it all right. But the right ingredients are important. Have you ever had something and you, you stuck it in your mouth and as soon as you put it in your mouth, you knew something was missing? The cake didn't have the right consistency. The pie didn't turn out right. My wife makes a chocolate pie, and every time she tries to make it, it doesn't set up like it's supposed to. And it, it is absolutely delicious, but I've changed the name to chocolate pudding pie. Because that's what it's like. <laughs> And so something doesn't happen. And so bread is the same way. If the ingredients are not right, the bread doesn't turn out right. 
It doesn't turn out like it should. Uh, the, the very first meal and, uh, that, that we had had, one of the first, well, I say the only bad meal uh, my wife and I ever had that she cooked. We were, we were newly married, living in our little duplex, you know, had our little table, little two seats. So cute. And she was pretty adventurous in cooking, and she's cooking this thing, and she made something. I, I don't know. It was eggplant something, I think, or eggplant parmesan, eggplant lasagna. I don't know what it was. But, bro, when I put it in my mouth... It was nasty. <laughs> but let me help any young married couples in here right now. You do not say that. You, you chew it up. You swallow it as best you can. You get it down and you just say, honey, you are the best <laughs> cook that I have ever met in my life. This is so good, I, I can't even bear to eat it. The only saving grace I had is when she put a bite in her mouth, she went, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> Another helper for you. You go, are you sure, honey? I mean, it's not, are, are you, it's not that bad. She's like, oh, no, that's nasty. We're not eating that. I'm like, all right, let's go. We'll hit the drive through Whatever we got to do, we'll take care of it. But we understood that something about it was not right. But one thing for certain, no matter what the ingredients that go in, they're the same no matter how big the piece may be. She said, it may not be my time. I may not be around the big table, but I may not have the background that others have. I may have a background that disqualifies me, that will stop me from being at the table. But I want you to know, if I can just get a crumb, if I can just get a crumb from the table, it will forever change my life. I wish there were some people that would understand, you're crumb worthy. I don't need a seat at the big table. Just give me a little crumbs because everything that's in the crumb is in the whole loaf as well. It's the same ingredients. Listen to me, please. The same anointing, the same power, the same blessing, the same forgiveness, the same deliverance, the same grace and same mercy is in the loaf that's in the crumb. Can I speak something to you? I want you just, if you didn't hear anything else I've said today, catch this. Don't be upset with the portion size. Be thankful for the ingredient. Don't be upset with the portion size. Be thankful for the ingredients. I, I wish some of us would get out beyond the fact of I don't have what they have and I don't I have the things that they have and why am I not blessed like they are and why do I not have the things? Why, 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 why? Quit worrying about why. Don't worry about the size. Don't worry about the ingredients. It's not about quantity. It's about the quality of what God has and it is the same in the crumb as it is in the loaf. Just like the woman with the issue of blood. Notice what she said. She said, if I can touch the hem, if I can touch the hem, she didn't say, I've got to get up and have him put his hand on my forehead. She didn't say, I've got to be able to touch him. I've got to be able to get a hold of him. I've got to be able to have him put his hand. She didn't say any of that. She said, if I can just touch the hem. And she crawled on her belly through all of the spit and dirt and junk that was on the ground. Getting stepped on by people around her. Getting stepped on and kicked and shoved to the side. And she just said, if I can just touch the hem. You know what she understood? The same anointing was in the hem that was at the top of the head. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to tell you. She said, I don't have to have all of the hoopla and attention. I don't have to have everybody seeing what's going on. I just got to get a hold of just a little bit of what Jesus had. Let me just touch the hem of his garment because the same power is in the hem that's in the whole loaf. The same power is in the hem that's in the whole garment. The same power is there. And when she had that revelation, the word says Jesus stopped. He said, hold on. Hold on, fellas. Somebody touched me. I can imagine the disciples are like, are you kidding me, Jesus? I mean, look at the crowd. 
everybody's pushing and shoving and we probably bumped into you I, I, we're, we're trying to do our best to you know keep everybody from getting but but i'm sure somebody here's bump you're, you're probably right somebody's probably touching he goes no 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 somebody touched me with faith and when they touched me with faith, it wasn't just about the pomp and circumstance. It wasn't just about the fact that Jesus was here. He said, when that person touched me, I felt virtue leave my body. You know why? Because the same virtue's in the him. Verse 28, what we opened with, said, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Her daughter was made whole from that very hour. He said, woman, because of the faith you have, it's not your time. You don't deserve it. You're not at the big table. It's not when you're supposed to get it, but because of your faith, because you're crumb worthy. Hmm. What you have to understand, I'm going to begin to close here this morning. What you have to understand is this. I don't know how it is around here. We say we're going to close. It really didn't mean anything. I just. We put it in our notes so you feel comfortable. Hmm. What you have to understand is it's not the crumb. It's not the hem. It's not the loaf. It's not any of those things that does the work. In every scenario, it is the faith. It is the faith. See, you need to get your faith engaged and realize that you are crumb worthy. By faith, you will be made whole. Your prayer will be answered and God will respond to you by your faith. Let me just share something with you here in the book of Hebrews. We say the 11th chapter is the faith chapter. But let me just kind of go through something here with you real quickly as we come to a close here. Verse number one of that chapter says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So from the very onset of the chapter, it lets you know you can't see it, but it's there. You you can't see it. Faith is the substance of things that you're hoping for. You can't see it. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. I I don't know how, I don't know when, and I don't know where, but I know this, he will. I I don't know about you, I have this thing about us, you know, when we say God can, I I believe that God can. I believe God's got the ability. I, I absolutely believe it. But when I say God will, I put a whole different level of faith in action. One of them speaks of my knowledge of what God is able to do. The other speaks of my faith of what God will do. Sometimes we get hung up too many times and say, God can. Oh, we know he can, but I got to get my faith engaged and say, God will. God's going to do it. God's going to move. God will move in my situation. But you go through that chapter and it just goes all through here, through faith and by faith, Abel and by faith, Enoch and by faith, Noah and by faith, Abraham and through faith, also Sarah and by faith, Abraham. You don't have time to go through all of these different examples, but he said by faith, Isaac and by faith, Jacob and by faith, Joseph and by faith, Moses and by faith, Moses again. And then he says, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea and by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. He goes through all these scenarios. And then he says in verse 32, and what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and also Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. He said, I don't have enough time. He must have been preaching on time schedule too. He said, I don't have time to tell you. I don't have time to tell you all the stories. I don't have time to tell you of all the things that happened when people had faith. But here's something that you have to realize. He started back in verse number six. He said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I wish to God somebody would get a hold of that verse and understand the only way that it happens is I've got to have faith and I've got to be persistent. I've got to be diligent in my 
seeking. God, I'm not going to quit till you bless me. I'm not going to stop till you touch me. I'm not going to quit, God, until you move. I'm going to continue to pray. And so faith is the first step. It's the first step to salvation, the first step to deliverance, the first step to healing, the first step to reconciling relationships. It's the first step to your restoration. Your first step is a step of faith. And so stand with me this morning. Here's the problem. Sometimes we get hung up on the what ifs. We get hung up on the what ifs. We say something like, I've heard you preacher. I've heard you rattle on now. For 30 minutes, I've heard you. I've heard you talk about faith. I've heard you mention all of these things. But what if nothing happens? What if, Josh, I take that step out? Because that first step has to be faith. First step has to be faith. So what, what, what if I take that first step? Nothing happens. It didn't stop the lady. She kept on. It didn't stop Bartimaeus. She kept on. It didn't stop the woman with the issue of blood. She kept on. But what if I make that step and nothing happens? This is going to be deep. Ready? Deep theology. You ready? Then what did you lose? If nothing happens and you stepped out by faith and nothing took place, then what did you lose? You got the same problem, the same situation, same sickness, same everything going on. What did you lose? You went to the doctor and didn't say, well, what if he can't heal me? but you win anyway, right? You're doing all the things you can do to try to fix whatever the issue may be, whatever the problem may be. But I, I'm just telling you today, what, what if you gave Jesus a shot? What, what if you took a step of faith, but what if nothing happens? Then you didn't lose anything. But there's a real strong chance. <laughs> there's a real strong possibility that when you come in faith you catch his attention even if you're a dog and you only deserve the crumbs even if you're blind and don't really deserve his attention even if you're so sick all you can do is get the him just maybe just maybe I'm telling you if he touches you today then the step was well worth it. Can I tell you, it'll probably be the easiest step you've ever taken. When you put the adversary's words out of your mind, when you put other people's doubt out of your mind, when you put your own doubt out of your mind and say, you know what, I'm going to give Jesus a chance. I grew up in this, and there's one song, Brother Josh, I don't know if y'all sing it here. If you do, then you'll just have to fix it later. I love when preachers come and say that in my pulpit. You can just fix it later, Pastor. I'm like, well, then don't say it. (laughs) If there's a chance I got to fix something, don't say it. But I'm going to do it because they do it to me. There's a song that we used to sing that said, when you've tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. Now, not a bad song, good principle. But the problem I have with it is, why did we wait and go through everything else before we ever tried it? Why not give him a shot first and save yourself a whole lot of aggravation and frustration? Bow your head with me this morning and remember, hear me this morning say, I believe with everything in me, there are some folks that God is speaking to here today. I don't know what your normal custom is here, but I'm going to open this altar and invite you to come here today. 
If you need a healing, I believe that God can heal you today. If you've got an issue that's going on in your family or your children, I believe that God will touch you today. But hear me, your past does not dictate your future. Where God wants to take you today is not going to be hindered by where hell has had you. You no longer have to be weighted down this morning by what God is willing to lift off of you today. And I truly wish that you would understand that you are crumb worthy and don't be worried about the portion size and don't be worried about what everybody else has and just be willing to take a crumb today. Come on, I'm not sure your situation. I don't, I don't know you here today. I'm just telling you that God sent me to tell somebody, don't quit right now. Don't stop right now. Don't give up right now. Don't throw in the towel right now. You have come for a reason today. And I don't know if it's a healing you need in your body. I don't know if it's a healing you need in your marriage. I don't know if it's a healing you need in your family. I don't know if it's a battle you've been fighting in your mind. I don't know if you felt like quitting because you just don't know if God hears you. I'm telling you right now, God hears every prayer. Just don't stop praying. Don't stop reaching because you are absolutely crumb worthy here today. God wants to touch you. Come on, if you need the Holy Ghost today, God can fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Whatever your touch you need today, God can do it for you. In the precious name of Jesus, God touched you.